So um, the next bit is the biophysical modeling. And I'm, I'm so glad nobody presented this yet this week because I could still present it and it's, it's different. <laughs> All right, biophysical modeling. What we're going to learn about and what's going to be really important is energy return on energy invested. Now, that's not a new thing. What's new is using it to understand um, future scenarios. Okay? So that's the methodology is to use energy return on investment in your future scenario. The thing that this is the, this, this is the punchline. I'm going to give you that first. This is the conclusion. This is actually obvious if you think about it, that if something has an energy return on energy investment of one, I, you know, it takes a barrel of oil to get a barrel of oil, then we have no economy, zero economy. We can't consume anything. We can't grow anything. We can't replace anything we've already built. Biofuels have an EROI of? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> we are essentially putting energy, good energy, down the drain to make biofuels. The same as, okay, well, like any other thing you want to make, like if you want to make lovely hats, go ahead and do it, but don't think you're solving an energy problem. If you want to make a lovely food additive for your fuel, go ahead and do it, but it doesn't solve an energy problem. And this is, I see the, the, the economists are getting restless. It's okay. <laughs> I'll behave. I'm not going to try and tell you how the economy works. What I'm going to say is, what I understand from you about how the economy works is that it sort of has this go round. And because it works on a human derived understanding. So like, we, we all agree, as long as we all agree that that exists, and as long as we all have a pretty good rough idea of how many hours I got to work to get some of that and what I can get for that, then this thing holds together. It can, it can get big and it can get small, but it just sort of circulates over here. <laughs> now, it can only work at all if there's some energy coming in, right? Um, that energy I'm calling production, energy produced. We have an energy transformation system. It takes uh, natural resources, water, minerals, and natural energy resources, extracts those, so, so that's the extraction rate, um, consumption rate, and it puts out waste, impacts, obviously. Now, that energy system only exists if you build it from the economy. So there's a energy input from the economy in the form of capital investment. We heard about that. And also, this energy system may take energy, consumer energy that otherwise people could have used to do other things and use it. So an oil refinery will use electricity from the grid, that sort of thing. So this isn't, this isn't internally um, um, parasitic energy, like the, the, the electricity to run a pump in a power station we take from our own production. It, it couldn't have existed for the economy if, if we weren't there anyway. So that's what we're looking at, things that actually come from the economy to run the energy transformation system. And energy return on investment, very simple. What did we produce compared to what did we have to take from the economy. So what do we put into the economy compared to what do we have to take out of the economy to produce that? Um, now here's a little, we, we look at energy flow diagrams all the time, but this one's going to have one important thing. We've got our um, take back energies. We've got the amount we produced. We've got all the fun things that we do with, with that energy. We use it, consume it, maintain the things we've already built. This one becomes a very interesting thing. Like if you look in the 50s, this was tiny. But now what we're having to spend to maintain what was built between now and then is pretty impressive. Everything we build comes with a commitment <laughs> to future feeding, right? OK. <laughs> and then, of course, anything we have left over from what we want to do and what we have to do to keep that going, we can use to do new things, build new things. And if you look at the balance of these flows during the 50s and 60s, this thing is gigantic, which is why we now have big ones there and there. <laughs> All right. So um, the important thing, like I said, is actually that one, because that is what we can use in the economy to do all these things. Balancing what we do with them in the end there, it's this bit, the bit that you actually get to use. <laughs> Sorry, what, huh? what is parasitic energy? Um, that's the, the 
consumer energy, so it's, it's things that could have been sold to somebody else, but the energy industry had to buy it. So fuel for diesel trucks to, to move water for fracking, you know. If they, took, if they took oil out of their tank and put it back into their tank, it wouldn't be there. Kind of self-consumption. No, because self-consumption, I'm sorry, that word parasitic isn't too good. <laughs> that's what I said it wasn't, and that's true. That, it's not that. Um, no, it's, it has to have a value to the economy to go there, because otherwise we don't really care, because otherwise it wouldn't exist. So I do want to look at the mathematics of this, because if you look at the ratio of the net energy to the economy to what we produced, it's a function of the EROI in a way that does this. Okay? This bit down here is essentially the percentage of all that running around getting energy that we did that went to the economy. So we want to be over here. If we're over here, we are growing, we're having a really good time, everything is great. Guess what? That's your industrial revolution right there. Because if you take all of the energy to walk over to where there's a big pile of coal, pick it up, move it over here, and chuck it into a boiler, <laughs> you get a huge return on that investment. And you have a lot of surplus to spend on other things, even if you're not very efficient. We're not looking at induced efficiency at all here. We're just looking at what's feeding the economy. And you don't have to pay a very big price. No energy tax there at all. <laughs> energetic tax, maybe. But what happens is we move over here. Well, if we take that coal and we put it in a coal-fired power plant and then sell the energy to people, we've taken a pretty good hit on that, and you all know why. Because we did send a lot of exergy out the window. We, we, we took a big cut of it out. But we have bumped the usefulness of that energy up a lot. Electricity, pretty darn useful. So that's that's not been a bad deal, really. That's, that's been a pretty good deal. Especially we don't really count the water and all that stuff. <laughs> what else have I got on here? I've got wind. And right now, if you look at the entire wind fleet, it sort of sits in here. Now, well, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And if you look at wind power with storage, it starts to fall off a little bit. <laughs> and if you look at solar PV, Boy, it really depends on what you do. If you put it in Germany, <laughs> if you put it in Arizona, you know, sort of, yeah. It takes a lot of energy to make it. And what you get back is the big factor that, that determines how much you get. OK, yeah, there's your, there's your biofuel <laughs> down there on that end. It was just an energy spend. It wasn't an energy source, and it won't ever be. That said, solid wood has been a good deal for humanity, right? I, I've been asking some of my lumberjack friends in New Zealand, how, much, how many days of work would it take for you to go out and chop down and bring in and pile and dry the wood for your family for a year? Because a lot of them use solid wood for heating. And so I know how good wood is. Wood is, wood is up in here. That's why civilization ran on it for a long time. All right, hydrogen, that's an energy penalty. Not even a good idea in any form. We've run through like every scenario we can. And there's, there's no way, that's just, if, if you want to blow some energy on something, you could be doing NASCAR racing. So at least you're employing scientists instead of rednecks. Never mind, here we go. <laughs> right, the other thing is that energy return on investment changes with time. Yeah, we have a learning curve. We get better. So when we first discover a resource, usually we discover the easiest to find ones first, and then we aren't all that good at using them, but we quickly get better because it was a good deal. And we have some surplus to spend on getting better. So our energy return on investment goes up pretty fast. All of the historical ones that we've seen, it goes up very fast. Then it'll hang out at about you know some average value, depending on where you're putting it and that for a while. And then you'll start to hit depletion effects. And those depletion effects can be, you know, with wind, good places to put it. With coal, you're having to go deeper and get it. Yeah. You know, so just the next resource you open up does not have as high an ERI as the previous one. And you keep moving that way. So the guy from Total who was telling us about this, you know, you know, lots and lots of oil. I'm sorry, but we're doing this. That's different than saying there's lots and lots of oil. Okay? Because our energy penalty is going to really start kicking up. So the reasons why the energy 
return on investment changes. I think we've pretty much discussed a lot of those. But I want to talk about it now in a story context because that will let you communicate it to other people. <laughs> All right. I got an apple tree and I'm going to get some apples. And if I don't really have a market for those apples, that's actually part of what makes the ERI pretty low because I don't invest in being able to get them quick or get them to market quick. <laughs> I just sit there and pick them. <laughs> so I, you know, I don't invest very much energy, but I don't get a whole lot back either because I don't do much. But then some neighbors come by and say, hey, we'll pay you for a thing of apples. And you go, oh, okay, so get up out of the chair. Oh, you've expended some more energy. And you have to go to the market and buy a basket. So you've got some capital investment. But it doesn't take you very long to fill the basket and get it to your neighbor. And they go, oh, thanks. And they give it to you. And then you go, hang on. I could make some money on this. So I'm going to hire somebody and buy some more baskets. And we're going to get sort of coordinated at how we do it. And we're going to move up the ROI curve on our Apple production. All right. Um, and then as we go along, of course, <laughs> we have picked most of the easy to pick ones. So now what we have to invest in is not just the basket to collect it and maybe the cart to move it to the market. We now have to invest in some pretty fancy equipment to get any apples. That's the trick. It's not just to keep our production. It's to get any. I can't get these ones at the top unless I wait for them to rot and fall off, which is kind of a bad product. All right. So I have to invest in a ladder, which is orders of magnitude more expensive than my basket, in order to get any more apples. And the apples I get? Not very many compared to the bottom. Okay, Low-hanging fruit. You can get that story. You can communicate to anybody why the future of oil is not like the past, even though we now have Saudi America. <laughs> okay, That is a really big ladder. <laughs> right. So in case you want data to back that up, you can look at some work that's been done by quite a few people. I've put the one that has my name on it. Um, in what is the energy return on investment of the fleet of oil production in America oh, in each year. So what you can see is at the beginning, we had a lot of these, none of these. Then we moved along, and we got stung. And so we went to Alaska and got some of that. We put that into the mix. And our really cool stuff down in Oklahoma and Texas started to drop out of the mix a bit. So our mix is moving down in ERI. So this is ERI, yeah, and that's our production. And then, oh, we have dropped off. No matter how much more recovery effort we put in, we're sticking CO2 down there, we're sticking hot steam down there, chemicals down there. Uh, ERI is dropping off pretty fast, coinciding with the peak, because now we're getting that ladder out, trying to get up the tree. <laughs> And then we start to get really desperate, and we go out there. Next, Antarctica, <laughs> the Arctic Circle. You know, it's like that. Tar sands. Guess where tar sands is? Estimates aren't too specific right now, but it's looking like under five at least. It's not good. All right. So, three. <laughs> okay, I'll take. Yeah, give me that data. We'll be on to it. Renewables. All right. Well, you all should get the. Uh, that's not in there yet either. The date only goes up to uh, the Gulf. Yeah, it's not good either. <laughs> so it's not that that's all we have. It's that that's what we're adding into the mix. So right now we're at about 20 EROI, which is still good. We are driving giant SUVs in America, you know. It's, a, it's not bad. You can definitely run a, an economy on 20, EROI of 20, no question. It's the future. That's the question. All right. So if the future is renewables, Right now, this is the data over the lifetime, over a 30-year lifetime. Oh, this one's actually 20, assuming that the, the fleet of American windmills will last 20 years. This is, this is an example of how you would calculate EROI for one windmill. But if you then take the fleet, um, we are about at EROI of 17 over the lifetime. So, so that's where we are. Now, the ones going up now, oh, so this is kind of obvious, right? You, you build the windmill, and then you get all that free energy later. So that stacks up. And um, so that's what you pay. This is cumulative. This is what you get out on average every year. And the little bit you have to do on maintenance, which actually grows quite a bit towards the end. Um, but you know, overall, oh, and if I gave you some more graphs on this, it's ridiculously sensitive to that one. 
the depletion effect with wind is going to be profound. If we start putting these things in Germany, you know, like where the wind doesn't blow or the parts of France where the wind doesn't blow, we aren't getting ER 17. <laughs> so Denmark's probably good and Wyoming, whew, that's pretty good. <laughs> Texas, that's a good place for them. And uh, NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab, their, their sort of latest data is showing that the new wind turbine generators with a nice 30-year life in a really good place like Texas and, and Oklahoma and that, they're getting 40. So the ERY for wind is actually on its way up. It's not on its way down. Unless we hit, you know, Benny or something. <laughs> Unless we hit some other depletion effect. <laughs> like steel starts taking a lot more coal to make or something like that. You know, ores of steel deplete or something. So the Gemba scenario, um, global energy model, biophysical approach. So, so that's taking into account. Okay, I'm about half done, so that's good. That's taking into account... Um, the EROI, and just connecting all those things together, stocks and flows with that set of, of processes, the assumptions, we need to know an incept date, we fit the model to historical data to get the parameters of that EROI function, um, we need to know where we are when we start, and we need to uh, have a pretty good model of what the EROI is, not, not pretty good, I mean, because you can play with it. So taking the best like most optimistic. So what I'm going to show you next is the ta-da, most optimistic version of everything. The burn baby burn scenario. We use all that fossil fuel because that is fun. And we also undergo the most rapid renewable energy investment. And we do not put in any rare earth limitations because we're too smart for that. You know, we'll, we'll find something else. Um, and no flow limitations. You know how when, um, like, without the hot air, it's like, well, there isn't enough land. We don't worry about that. What if you could have all the land you wanted? So we didn't put any, any constraints on anything. And here's the future. All right, so red is the historical behavior of the system. So that's the data. The black line is the known fossil fuel reserves at the EROI that they are known at. So we consume them with patriotism. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then we do hit a peak. That's coal, gas, oil. It's all going in the air, baby. All right. And then it declines. And nobody can argue with that, really. So the model looks pretty good. And then, but that's just the model of, there's three different things here I'm spitting out. One is what happened to the production from oil and gas and fossil fuels? What happened to the, per, oh, I'm sorry. This is total. There's, here's our non-renewables in blue. I should use black for that. Um, our non-renewables peak and decline. Our renewables, I told you, we're gonna, we're gonna invest in those like crazy. And then our total. But what's really important there? What's the vertical axis? Uh, um, that is the total energy production. Why, why, why could I thought I put it on there. Regarding renewable infrastructure uh, decline? Just say again. Fossil fuel decline. You cannot build wind. Yeah, renewable is the gray one because it comes up. Non-renewable is blue. Bad choice. Should have picked a black color. And this is total. If you put them together. The idea is that you need non-renewable energy to build and maintain renewable infrastructure, right? Okay. Right. So if you burn all of your fossils now, you won't have them to keep your renewables going or to build the next generation or the next generation. Can't run a solar fab lab on solar. <laughs> it doesn't work. Can't run a mine on solar, right? So, but what's really important there, you might have thought you saw what was important, it's actually this one. We are at peak net energy to the economy. That's why we can't get out of recession. No surplus. And we've built this giant thing that needs feeding. And we are not going to talk about the biggest arrow, which is consumption. Okay? So what does this tell us? This is the net. Remember that one? What the economy actually has to run on? So while we are trying to build, basically building the renewables takes over the entire purpose of the economy. <laughs> You've got nothing left to do anything else with. Hmm? All right. So that's kind of a weird way to go. There are other ways to go. What I will tell you is they all come out like this. The net energy we will have to run the economy on, no matter if we decide to, say, sort of freeze this where we are now and save a bit for later, decline this for now, save the planet for later, it all comes out. We are looking at a very low energy future for our economy. Doesn't matter how you look at it. Have to get demand down, right? 
Conclusion. <laughs> what are we going to do about that? We have to understand anthropogenic system dynamics. We got any electrical, mechanical engineers? This is feedback control theory. It's how we make things work, <laughs> okay? You don't have to understand it. What you have to understand is that I am a crazy woman and I applied this theory to human behavior <laughs> in 1986. And okay, Arizona State University, after my presentation, my poor committee sat there and said, <laughs> well, it seems right, but that's the strangest thing I've ever seen. Somebody actually trying to model humanity. Truth is, I've applied this. That's why I know so much about history, because I have bloody dug into history to see, is this theory right? Somebody proved to me that I have to adjust it. It's right. And what it tells me, that's all that matters, what it tells me. Do you want to know what it tells me? The built environment trumps economy. Did you see where the economy was in it? Economics, economic behavior, choices. It's in the middle. Man, that took me a year and a half to figure that out. I'd put it over here all the time. <laughs> it's not there. It's the way we get done what we want to do. It's not why we want to do anything. All right, anyway, what it tells me is that if there is a civilization of people like us with our core values, they still have them, and our knowledge not a dark age, in 150 years, and they are using a farmer's almanac. That's my short way of saying climate's still working in a predictable way. <laughs> you know a farmer's almanac? Yeah, okay, good. Then, if, then, they will have undergone a transition of all engineered systems to very low and very tolerant and highly resilient <laughs> and renewable-based systems and with well-managed demand. That's the only requirement. <laughs> but guess what? If you start working on that, like I did a long time ago, once I saw that, that human behavior adapts. Boom! I got here, I didn't know anything, and I, can't even, I haven't even spoken French yet, and I can still manage. That's how fast we are. We are fast adapters. You change the system, behavior follows. As long as it works. If it doesn't work, nobody wants it. Just gonna make it work, all right? So, release your mind, engineers and scientists of the world. Stop telling yourselves, oh, but you can't change behavior. You're, no, you're wrong. Nope. Go do some mental, mental experiments yourself. Take a Texan from Houston and put them in Perry, and they will change their behavior. Not much, but a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so let's do the if-then synopsis of, this, of the weekend, shall we? All right, well, from my point of view, if the anthropogenic system dynamic theory is correct, which as I said, in my view it is, then behavior adapts to reality. Survival depends on adaptive capacity. Survival. Not staying the same. Survival depends on being adaptable. That's why we can do it. <laughs> That's why we're good at it. Um, survival is the driver for culture. Economics is a linkage in a complex system, not the reason for it. Collapse is a valid adaptation to achieve survival. <laughs> Learning by suffering. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. If the biophysical model is correct, then people in the future are really hoping that we invest now in food systems, cities, production systems, water supply systems, sewage systems that don't need much energy because they won't have it. If even one of the climate models scenarios is correct, even one, then reality is we have already changed the climate in ways that pose risk. Greenhouse gas emissions and activities must be curtailed. I think that's a lot easier than trying to figure out how to tweak your, I don't know. I mean, is there one of those scenarios that, <laughs> No, if even one of them is right, cumulative knowledge tells you something that sometimes looking at details inside doesn't. <laughs> if even one of the climate impact scenarios is correct, reality is we have already changed the climate in ways that pose risk and greenhouse gas emissions and activities must... Did I forget not change that? <laughs> no, kind of the same conclusion. <laughs> All right. If any one of the oil industrial, oil industrial materials 
uranium, water, scenarios, you can keep going with that, are correct then. Reality is, future will be characterized by the degrowth of industrial activity and demand must decline. Unless I didn't understand you right. <laughs> All right. If any of the decarbonization of electricity and fuel scenarios is true, then reality is the future will be characterized by the degrowth of industrial activity and demand must decline. If any of the cost estimates of decarbonization of electricity are true, then reality of the future will be characterized by the degrowth of industrial activity and demand must decline. If any of the models describing behavior and infrastructure of the decarbonization of electricity are true, yeah, intermittency, we need a super grid, we need a super smart grid. If any of that is true in order to have our RE system, then the reality is that the future will be characterized by the degrowth of industrial and demand must decline. And if Reiner and Cedric are right, and if I understood them correctly, then the reality is the future will be characterized by investment in capital to reduce consumption and produce renewables and demand must decline. <laughs> All right, so we're, we're sort of coming to a conclusion here. It's a bold assumption, you know, that we suppose that Cedric might be right. <laughs> <laughs> that was my high risk slide. It was an if, it was an I if. trust somebody to came here only for skiing, you know. <laughs> Hey, he suffered greatly here. All right. If there are no green energy technology miracles, and that's what I know, I could have given you a whole lecture on that. You know, being a person who's, who's worked on just about every one of the green energy miracles, if those are not going to save us, then you know what the answer is. All right. Same as before. Reality is the future will be characterized by continued domination of fossil fuels. And the only way to reduce emissions is that demand must decline. The only reliable way to reduce emissions is to use less fossil fuel. <laughs> That's it. Who's working on that one? We're working on things around it, but not on that one. We had a hint of it that, well, we could tax it. Where's our economist? We could tax it. We could cap and trade it. All right. That's all I have to say. 